Falling Sand games have been around since the mid-90s, but they recently become popular again thanks to a roguelike game called Noita. And Noita uses the Falling Sand concept to create a world where every pixel could potentially kill you. Most of the Falling Sand games out there now run on the CPU, but for the last few weeks I've been experimenting with writing Falling Sand games and effects in fragment shaders using the GPU. In this video I want to explain how I do this and show you some of the more interesting things I was able to make. Falling sand simulations are a type of cellular automata, or automata, where a set of rules is used to simulate the movement of sand and other materials. Like other cellular automata, we have a grid of cells, usually a 2D array, and the cells can change state based on neighboring cells and the rules. For a basic falling sand game, a cell can be either sand or empty. We move from left to right and bottom to top in the array, and at each cell that has sand, we test the following rules. If the cell below is empty, change it to sand and change this cell to empty. Otherwise, if the cell diagonally below and left is empty, change it to sand and change this one to empty. Otherwise, if the cell diagonally below and right is empty, change it to sand and change this one to empty. Otherwise, leave the sand where it is. With just these simple rules, we can simulate how sand falls and topples off of other sand. We would also set an update flag if we change a cell state so we know not to change it again in the same frame. Now, in a fragment shader, it's a bit different. We already have a 2D array of cells because shaders are already set up like that. Instead of a double for loop though, all pixels do their work simultaneously in a given frame. We also can't change the state of neighboring pixels. So to get around all this, I tried saying, if an empty pixel sees that one above it has sand in the last frame, then this pixel will fill itself with sand now. Likewise, if a pixel with sand looks down and sees an empty cell, then it will empty itself. So I did this, and I did the same for each of the diagonals, and I remembered to set the update flag, and I got this. The problem is that all the pixels update at the exact same time once per frame, so if two empty cells check diagonally above them and see sand, they will both fill their own cell with sand. That's multiplying our sand as it falls. My first attempt at dealing with this was to split the rules up into three frames plus a fourth frame to reset the update flag. As you can see, that actually works, but it's already a bit slow because we now take four frames to simulate each time step, and that's just for the sand material. So how can we solve this? Here's what I found in this research paper. We can divide the grid into 2x2 two two cell blocks. Now instead of thinking about which way we should look to see where sand is, we can just say each 2x2 two two group is in some state. Then we can make a set of rules that still describe sand falling and toppling but that uses these 2x2 two two block states. That gives us a whole new perspective on falling sand rules which actually kind of blew my mind. The only problem is, once we update once with these rules, none of the 2x2 two two blocks will need to change state again. So to keep things updating, we can shift this grid diagonally up and right by one cell each, which gives us a new grid where things can update. If we keep shifting back and forth between these two grids and updating each frame, then we'll have a working sand simulation that runs at 60 frames per second. This alternating set of 2x2 two two cell blocks is called the Margulis Neighborhood. One last thing, as you can see, sand falls all to one side first and then all to the other. That's a function of how the basic Margulis neighborhood works, but real sand is more even. The paper solves this by cycling through four 2x2 two two grids instead of just two. So within four frames, it's moving on two diagonals instead of just one. Now I want to show you some of the things I made with these ideas. The first one I'll show is colored sand, since many of my other ideas depend on this concept. With colored sand, we want each grain of sand to have a color and to keep that color as it moves. So that means for each 2x2 two two block of cells, we need to figure out which cell sand will be moving into. Then we need to access the cell where the sand is moving from and grab all the data from it. So I had to rework the sand rules here. But uh, once I had that, I attempted to remake colored sand from the coding train video, meaning I filled a UI with similar complementary colors and played around with it. Once I figured out color, water was easy because it's the same idea. Water needs to move sideways when it can't go straight or diagonally down, that way it will spread out. To make this work, I randomly initialize each water cell as either right moving or left moving, 
and when it's moving sideways, it's supposed to keep going in that initial direction until it can't go any further. Then it switches directions. This idea of initializing water with left or right is from a video by Toad Pond on YouTube called The Top 9 Ways to Make Water. My imagination was switched on once I got even the basic sand working. One morning I woke up early, uh, way too early, and I had remembered this story that I read a while ago. Someone had been living in a house with a giant beehive in their attic and they didn't know about it. The hive became really heavy and one day the attic collapsed. So yeah, I, I wondered wh how much of that could I simulate in a falling sand game? So I started with a bee material. First the bees would just move randomly using very simple rules. Later, I had them move towards wherever the mouse last clicked. The flying movement was done only when there is one or two bees alone in a 2x2 two two block. The rule finds which of the four cells fits the desired flying direction, along with some randomness, and just puts the bee cells there. Randomness was tricky, I had to calculate an ID for each 2x2 two two block and pass that to the rule set so I could put randomness in the rule set. On top of bees, I added a wood material which doesn't move when you place it, but bees can eat through it slowly. Then I made a hive material. In addition to having all the movement rules that sand has, the hive material produces honey and bees. I didn't want to add a rotting wood material just to prove the concept, so the hive also randomly turns neighboring wood cells into honey instead. Honey moves a lot like water and can also turn wood into honey. This means if you have an attic made out of wood and a giant beehive in it, then eventually the hive and the honey will eat through the wood and the hive will fall. With the hives producing bees and being able to move bees by left clicking, it started to feel a lot like a real-time strategy game. For me, like Starcraft and like mass-producing mutalisks or zerglings and leading them to an enemy base. So here is a very basic real-time strategy concept I made. You can create beehives, which generate bees. I built a basic box selection tool so you can select bees. I also use the same principle of moving information with a cell so you can save where a bee was commanded to go. Here I've set up a mini example where they're being sent to attack wood. And you can press C to cancel a selection which means the bees will keep moving towards the target and then you can select more bees to do other things. You'll have to press C vigorously though, I didn't get that completely sorted out. After that, I tried using full textures to initialize materials. Here I'm using the textures available on Shader Toy and just using luminance to determine which material it should be. Shader Toy is also webcam enabled, so here's me using that to get texture data. This is what led me to experiment with video. Once I saw my webcam input turn into falling sand, I started thinking about interactivity. What I really wanted was an interactive falling sand video effect. The main challenges were keeping the video clear, not overwriting sand as things move, and the limitations of falling sand itself. I started by making it so that on any frame, there is a percent chance that sand will be created or destroyed at any given pixel. That makes sure that there's sand falling everywhere, but that sand doesn't build up and cover the whole screen. Then I change the sand rules so that the chance of sand rules even working is based on how dark the image is. I turn the video into a silhouette and use that to try the rule condition so sand falls only where it's dark. The problem here was that with sand falling everywhere, the image just didn't look clear. In another attempt, I initialized the video silhouette to rock and kept updating the rock so that sand could fall on top of it. That was better, but still not dynamic enough. That brings me to this. In this version, sand falls only around the edges where things change from light to dark. So I tweaked the contrast and color settings to get even more clarity. Then I fooled around with the lifetime of the sand particles. So now we have something where sand clearly is spilling off of a main object in the image and hanging around wherever it lands and is still moving like sand and still keeping the color that it had when it was initialized. 
If I were to make this even more robust, I would make it so that different color sand could have different lifetimes. So you would have a light green color that might be rare in a video, but when it falls, it stays there. Or a red, like if it was a fighting game and you wanted blood to have a longer lifetime. Things like that would be cool. I was able to take this falling sand video effect a bit further by using ASCII or text characters to make a kind of matrix rain effect. I think it's cool that unlike the usual um, matrix effect or even the, the ASCII effect, the characters stay the same as they fall and they topple on other characters, so it kind of looks like I'm bathing in code. This isn't the first ASCII shader I've made and shown on this channel by the way. If you like what you've seen here, you'll probably really like this video on how I made the weirdest ASCII renderer ever. In case anyone's interested in how the GPU performs uh, versus the CPU, in Noida they have a huge procedurally generated world, but they only simulate 1024 by 1024 pixels of it at any one time. Here using the GPU at a resolution of 1920 by 1080, I'm simulating around 2 million pixels or twice as many. Uh, the thing is, my graphics card right now is only using as many pixels as my monitor can handle. This 10-year-old MSI laptop has a GTX 950M graphics card that supports 4K resolution, so technically I could simulate a world four times as large as this one at 60 frames per second. To be fair, I'm only simulating around nine materials and some of their interactions, which is nothing like what's happening in Noida. There are also trade-offs like memory and the graphics card being bad with branching. From what I've read, it's specifically branching where different pixels are likely to be branching in different ways. So I think there is potential for GPUs to take some of the load in Falling Sand games, but that's all I can say for now. So that's what I know so far about Falling Sand on the GPU and some of the things you can do with it. I'd love to know which of these ideas you thought was the coolest and uh, how you could see it used, etc. Any other questions or feedback is also welcome. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.